Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, this session is uh, Why Estimations Go Wrong and How to Avoid It, which I know is a fairly lofty title, but hopefully I can at least give you something useful to um, help you out with this problem. Um, my name is Pamela Brown. I'm a client service manager at a Drupal shop based in Sydney. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our sh um, actual organization, but um, just a quick intro there. So just getting right to the point, um, the sort of hypothesis of this talk is that the estimate is not the problem, the scope is the problem. So if you're constantly finding that you're missing your estimates and your team is bad at estimating, it's highly likely that the problem is that you're not defining what they're estimating well enough. Because I mean, um, estimating is just guessing how long something's gonna take, right? So that's actually not that hard as long as you're estimating a specific thing. It's generally not that hard to get somewhat close. So um, I mean, if that's true, then how come we mess it up so much? Um, and I mean, just looking back at some of the worst cases we've had, it's almost never because uh, something took way longer than we thought. It's because whatever we estimated was not what the client was actually expecting. And so we had to continue doing other things in order to um, satisfy their expectations. So the best way to get better at estimating is by getting better at defining what you're estimating. So this is a um, kind of a real life disaster that I'll take you through. And um, it seems very simple, right? We got a request from a client on a site we built that they'd like to add ReadSpeaker. Can, can you please estimate this for us? If you don't know, ReadSpeaker is a text-to-voice plugin that you can add to your page, and it just reads the page out. So there's sort of a play button, and it just reads the page. So um, they had bought a license for the software, and they wanted us to install it. So it's a pretty simple, reasonable, standard request. Like, what could go wrong, right? Um, this is how we interpreted it, right? So if you have ever used Drupal before, you can probably see where this is already going off the rails. So um, what happened next was the project manager who's in charge made a ticket that actually said add read speaker module. The dev estimated adding the read speaker module at a whopping, you know, like four hours. And then the project manager added some buffer, making it 5.25, which is like really oddly precise. And then um, eight months later, we had spent more than 60 hours implementing this feature. And as you can imagine, the client was really cranky and the devs were really cranky because this was like the never ending story. Um, so, I mean, as I said, if you've ever dealt with a Drupal module before, you can probably sort of guess where this went wrong, but um, what the heck took so long? Well, a lot of things, but basically the module provides a block. Um, I'm not gonna go into the graphic details, but we couldn't place the block exactly where they wanted on every page because uh, we were using Panelizer, and so, you know, Drupal, Drupal, Drupal. Um, we uh, had issues with regions where it was relying on a region and the region didn't exist on certain pages, so every time we thought we were done, they kept coming back and going, ah, oh, it's not on the search page, oh, it's not on the landing page, and so it was just like this never-ending cascade of continuing, um, continuing effort. So, uh, a lot more things went wrong that I won't bore you with, but um, the other final sort of nail in the coffin was they actually had two sites, and we had to add it to both sites in the five hours, which, um, just didn't work. So um, what did we do wrong? Well, first of all, we didn't ask seemingly any questions, right? The client said, we bought this thing, we need you to add to the site, and we went, yeah, okay, sure, it's probably easy. Um, we didn't account for never having done this before, so ReadSpeaker was new to us, it wasn't something we'd ever used. Um, we were completely unaware of what might go wrong, but that um, obviously you need to kind of just look out for that and not just assume that it's gonna be easy. Um, we, we should have assumed, like I said, it wasn't gonna be just a case of adding the module. We probably should have downloaded the module, installed it, tested it out, saw what it did, and then kind of went back to them and said, hey, so this is all well and good, but where do you want it? You know, wh what other kinds of customizations might we need to make? Um, and we didn't, we didn't tell them honestly that this was what we were doing, we were installing a module, right? We estimated installing a module that was nowhere near what they expected. Installing the module wasn't gonna give them what they wanted. And then finally, um, sort of a organizational issue. We didn't, we didn't push back on the requirements as they kind of kept coming at us. We didn't sort of stop and say, okay, you know, we've kind of met the original, sort of the initial implementation, let's step back, see what, um, what else you want, how long it's gonna take, and then kind of maybe re-estimate. Um, you know, it took eight months for us to finally get to that point, so. Um, then just stepping back a little bit about our team, we're a very small, uh, mostly dev shop, so um, about 15 to 20 uh, total on our team, depending, and um, we're actually one of the top five core contributors by company, so um, gotta mention that. Um, we're agile, no, no sales team, we have a couple client service managers, and we have just kind of like a small team, everyone, everyone helps out. 
um, our projects vary in size from about 20 grand to about 500 grand, and we have a lot of um, clients we've worked with for many years, so uh, it's a lot less of the procurement side and a lot more of kind of constant requests from existing clients to do new features, new projects, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. Um, so what are we estimating on a daily basis? Um, just a couple of things quickly that we do, right? There's pricing a large project for a tender. And um, you know, in this case, you don't want to estimate too high and lose the project, but you also don't want to estimate too low and be on the hook to deliver something um, that you can't and you end up losing money. So this is usually really high level estimates um, based on sort of relative size. And it's often really hard, th this type of estimating is really hard because you generally don't have a lot of detail about what they're expecting, but you kind of have to come up with something and you can't workshop every single requirement in order to respond to a tender, but I think um, the same strategy sort of still applies even though it's at a very high level. Um, the next thing is sort of is what we do a lot more often, which is in sprint estimating. Um, after the project has started, we're just trying to estimate the actual stories for planning purposes so the client can prioritize and so we can kind of plan out what we're gonna do in each sprint. Um, this is obviously more detailed than a tender, but it's not as important to be sort of accurate to the hour because you're doing, you know, um, say 100 stories, it kind of averages out. So you might be high on some, but hopefully you'll be low on others. And then this is actually what we do the most of. It's generally, like this could happen every single day. There's something we're estimating that's uh, usually something pretty specific. So it could be anything from um, a half day's work. So, you know, we need to add a new field or a new filter to um, we have a new site that we need to build. We just need an estimate so that we can secure the budget. Um, but I mean, I ch try to treat everything as sort of its own little um, project because there, there's really nothing that's too small not to spiral out of control as we saw with the Reed speaker uh, example. So this is, as I said, the bulk of the estimating that we do is kind of the daily back and forth with existing clients. Um, and this is kind of what I've arrived at as my guiding principles of estimating. Um, first, I myself need to understand what the client is expecting us to deliver and how we're gonna do it. So I take that on as my responsibility as the client service manager. Um, I also try to be at least somewhat confident that what I think the client is expecting is actually what they're expecting because thinking that I know is not as good as actually knowing. And then lastly, I also think it's my responsibility to ensure that my developers have enough information to implement this feature successfully, ideally on the first try, but hopefully just without too much frustration. Um, when we get a request that comes in, this is just generally what happens. Um, the client will contact me or one of my colleagues at, on the client service team. Um, we'll assess it, ask any obvious questions we can think of, um, send it on to a dev. They'll ask us questions, we'll ask the client questions. It's kind of a, a circle of, uh, communication, and then finally, when we think we all can agree on what we're doing, we, uh, the dev will estimate it, the project manager will add some buffer, you know, for testing and communication, stuff like that, and then the PM sends the estimate to the client. So um, one thing I will stress here is all of our estimates are on some level at some point vetted by a developer, so we don't have any sort of sales team that's coming to us and going, here we pitched this project, um, you, you have to do it in this amount of time because that's what we said. So we just don't have that dynamic at all. Um, any work we do is gonna be estimated by a member of the team who's going to do the work. Um, I mean, because we're a small team, we're all accountable in this sense. So, um, you know, if a developer goes off and does a really bad estimate and then someone else is on the hook for it, they're gonna feel like a jerk. And so we kind of, the size of our team enables us to really um, work together and collaborate. Um, and then, I mean, one other thing I mentioned is it, it can be really hard to find the time that's necessary to do this properly, especially when we're really busy. So um, we have to kind of keep reminding ourselves that uh, work is more fun than estimates, but the estimates are how we get the work. So um, we, we do have to kind of remind ourselves to focus on that. Um, and I don't know if anybody's ever said this before. I'm sure you've all heard it before, but um, it's not just my company, and it's not just Drupal, and it's not just web development, it's sort of software development in general. Uh, you just hear this, right? Devs are so bad at estimating. But I mean, I think that um, the critical thing here is like what's more likely, that all developers are terrible at estimating or that something else is kind of going wrong in this process. Um, the read speaker example, in that case, the developer didn't estimate it badly. He was told to estimate something, and that's what he estimated. It turned out that what he estimated was the bad thing. 
Um, so, you know, in that case, we planned to do a thing that didn't actually satisfy what the client was after. Um, and then, like, to be sure, some devs are kind of bad at estimating, but I think that the ones who, the ones on our team anyway, who are consistently good are the ones who um, consistently ask questions and try to challenge and try to find out exactly what they're being expected to deliver. And the ones who continually miss are the ones who kind of oversimplify, assume that they know what it is, and don't actually tell you that they're unclear about something until it's too late. Um, so, I mean, I think the key thing here is that we don't treat this as a one-sided process of like, uh, chuck a thing at them, then they chuck it back, and then you know I'm like, well, I don't know. They they, they told me what it they they told me what it was. I don't need to worry about it. Um, the devs have got it covered. I feel a, a serious responsibility to make sure that I'm not first of all wasting their time, so that I'm not sending them something to estimate that makes no sense or isn't possible or just kind of is strange. Um, and I love the developers I work with who challenge me and say, what the hell is this? You know, this makes no sense or um, even even better, I actually don't know how to do this, so we're going to need to, you know, spend some more time in it or do some research, or something like that. So I mean, um, I really rely on them to catch the things that I miss. So I'll try to pick out the obvious things, but I rely on them to catch the things that I miss, and they know that. And so I think because they know that, I'm respecting their time and I'm respecting their advice. They they appreciate that and they sort of reciprocate by respecting my time and um, and respecting my advice. So I think. Um, one of the things we've tried to do is talk to the team about what the typical pain points are with our estimations. And for us, one of the biggest ones is that oftentimes the developer who estimated isn't the one who does the work because so much time has passed and then by the time we won the job, they were working on something else. Or even if it's just so much time has passed that the developer who estimated it can't remember what the hell they were thinking. So um, one of the guidelines we have is make sure you leave notes about what you were planning to do um, and that way, just as a refresher, when you come back to it in three months' time, you don't have to start from scratch and do it all over again. Um, and the other thing that we find a lot is uh, if it goes over, the dev says, well, I actually forgot that I had to do this in order to do this. So um, that's where the breaking it down comes from. So anytime a dev estimates something that's more than four hours and it's not broken down, I'll go back to them and say, I need you to list this out for me, just so that I'm sure that you're sure that this is going to be done in under eight hours. Um, and then if simple things like um, anything larger than 16 hours, we, we want to get a kind of sanity check, so get another developer to review it. And then um, lastly, we find any time that there's a lot of custom code, there's a greater chance of peer review sort of slowing things down. So any um, feature that we do gets reviewed by another member of our team. And in that process, you know, the review takes time. And then if there's feedback on the code, which if you've ever worked with developers, they've always got some kind of feedback on each other's code, um, that takes time as well. So we try to try to factor that in. And um, you know, these are just some examples. But these are things you can work with your team to come up with. And it's, like, it's really simple and probably pretty obvious. But it really does help just to kind of um, set that uh, sort of foundation. And when you're in doubt, um, it always helps to actually spend some time trying to figure out, um, you know, more information. So um, oftentimes the devs will say, look, um, I think this module will do what we want, but I've never used it before. Can I spend two hours installing it, um, seeing what it does? And of course, please, please spend two hours. Because if you spend two hours up front, that might save you from spending 40 down the road because your estimate is more accurate. Um, and um, I have one dev that, I don't know if he's here, but he always asks me for a design and it drives me crazy sometimes, but he's almost always right. Um, so it's annoying, but helpful. So I mean, just on that, I think it's really important that your developers feel comfortable challenging you and asking you for that extra information, um, even if sometimes you might give them grief about it. So I mean, just a note sort of for the developers in the room that, um, Certainly in our company, we try to make the developers feel like they're engaged in the process. It's not a process that we're handing over to them and that they have to follow. We need their feedback. They're obviously critical to this entire operation. So we want them to feel engaged. We want them to feel involved. We want them to feel valued. So um, we encourage them, if they ever have a problem, um, tell us first and not last. You know, It's happened a number of times where we had something go really wrong. And then at the end, the developer said, oh, well, you know, I knew that was going to happen because such and such. It's like, well, why didn't you just say that? Um, if they feel comfortable saying it, uh, I think that you're you're better off. And um, 
you know, I think it also kind of trickles down. So if they see me challenging the client and, and trying to get more information, they'll feel more comfortable that that's sort of the appropriate process and they'll feel better about doing it themselves. Um, so the other piece to this is uh, the old, my clients are impossible because they always change their mind, they never know what they want, they're always adding to scope. So I've heard this a lot, I've even said this a lot, but I think it, it comes back to the dev um, question of like, if this keeps happening, maybe you should sort of have a look inward and try to figure out what is happening in your organization that is enabling this to continue to happen. So, um, I mean, I think the, the key thing for me is that clients aren't doing it on purpose most of the time. Um, so, like, the big thing with, with our clients, especially as we work with a lot of government and sort of non-really technical background-ish type people, so um, they often don't really know what you need to know in order to figure something out. So um, it could be that their request is really, really vague and you know you kind of have to workshop it with them to figure out exactly what problem they're trying to solve. Or sometimes I get where um, the request will be really, really specific. Like we need you to add a new fillable panel pane so that, and it's like, wait, 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 like what, hold on, what are you trying to do? And then we'll figure out, like we'll tell you the best way to do this in Drupal. That's our job, sort of leave that to us. So if you kind of distill it down into just what's the problem that we're trying to solve, you can then kind of work up from there rather than just kind of going, um, you know, here, estimate this, and then hand it back. So obviously asking questions is critical. Um, they, they will definitely have made some assumptions about how they thought it was gonna work, and we've, I'm sure, all had the situation where you deliver something and then they go, oh, that's not how I thought it was gonna work. Um, the best way to avoid that is by asking them how they think it will work. And I would say strongly to anybody who's on the client side, if you ever ask for something and um, you get an estimate back without any questions or clarification or uh, discussion, don't trust it. <laughs> you might actually have to be the one that's challenging your um, vendor to prove that they understand what it is that you actually want. Um, the next sort of principle I try to follow is to be really specific. So, Tell them exactly what the estimate includes, and that's a way of flushing out what isn't included that they might have thought was included. So I actually picked this up from my partner who's a painter, he's a painting business, and whenever he does an estimate, he lists the specific tasks that he's gonna be doing. So it's prep, two coats, uh, and then cleaning. And then that gives the, the, the customer the opportunity to say, well, these, you know, th this wall is going from dark to light, so I actually think it's going to need three coats. And he can say, okay, well, then I'll charge you for three. And you have that conversation at the beginning rather than at the end when the client says, oh, it needs three coats, you should do it for free. So you kind of completely avoid that conversation because you've been really specific at the beginning. And then, of course, it does give you something to reference later. If the scope does start to spiral, you can refer back to the fact that you were really specific. And so if they assumed something was there that wasn't there, that's really on them, not on you. And then be, be really honest because sometimes we really don't know how to do something and it's totally fine to say this. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes we have to go to the client and say, look, I know what you want. We actually have no idea how we're gonna do it. It might take 20 hours and it might take 100. So is it okay with you if we spend four or if we spend eight doing a bit of a spike, trying to figure out how we can get closer and then we have a better sense. We can kind of come back to you and be more specific. Um, I mean, they can then decide what to do based on this information. So in some cases they might say, you know what, it's not that important, it's not worth the risk, forget about it, which is fine. Or they might say, well this is something that we really need, we need you to do it anyway, so yeah, go ahead and spend a little bit of time up front and then we'll kind of um, reevaluate it once we have more information. Uh, the next thing I would advise you to do is to profile your clients. Um, all of my clients are very different and the way I handle estimations with them as a result is very different. So um, I have all different kinds of clients. Some of them prefer to spend a little bit of time up front and then iterate and provide feedback and continue to kind of estimate that process and get more budget throughout. But I have other clients that are big government agencies where it's really challenging for them to get budget. So they wanna know what's the absolute worst case scenario, give that to me, I'll get that approved, and then I know I have kind of um, some room to move there. So we don't need to know everything up front, but we know we have time to address whatever might come up in the future. And if you have a new client, just assume the absolute worst and um, you can't really go wrong there. So, I mean, I kind of mentioned this before, but it's not really just about 
kind of having some fine print that you can refer back to. Ideally, you won't get to that point where you're kind of arguing with them about what you initially agreed to do. So that is a, an element of it. But for me, it's really more about making the process more efficient. So if you know at the start what the end is going to be, you can do that from the beginning. Whereas if you do something and then hand it over and then they say, oh, actually, it's not what I thought, then you have to kind of go back. And I mean, a, a simple example of this uh, was happening to us the other week where we had a, a client that wanted a new search page. And so they listed all the fields to build and the developer went off, estimated it, built the search, sent it over. And the first feedback was the order's all wrong, the layout's all wrong. So you know, now we were stuck with, well, it had already been implemented. It's a lot harder to change it at that point than it would have been to just do a mock-up. And the mock-up doesn't need to be a you know, Photoshop file. It can be just a sketch. But at least then you're kind of setting their expectation and, and forcing them to think about things that they might not have otherwise thought about. Um, like Obviously, that's just more efficient to do at the beginning than at the end. And also, I mean, if you, if you handle it this way, you're much less likely to have surprises. And when you do have surprises, they're a lot less frequent and they're a lot easier to manage because the client's not constantly, you know, being sort of provided with, with bad news. It's not just constant bad news. Occasionally, you'll have something you weren't expecting, but on the whole, um, it's pretty smooth. And, and I mean, everyone's happier. Like, developers hate revisiting things five times. And, and the developer who did that, um, that search feature, uh, I, I spoke to the PM and he was saying, oh, well, it's taking way longer than the JIP said it would. And I, I was like, wait a minute, let me check. And I looked at the story and I thought, well, of course, there's not enough information here for him to have been sure of what the client wanted. N nobody could have been sure. And that wasn't you know, an attempt on the client's part to be sneaky. It was because the client didn't understand what information we needed in order to get it right on the first try. Um, and also, just this might be obvious, but we have a really awesome team, and that helps a lot. Uh, I think that anytime you have a team where the devs treat the pr the PMs or the or the devs treat the BAs as the ones who are like responsible for this, or you know, it's it's one role, and they're the ones on the hook, and they're the ones doing all the work, um, that's not going to be effective. It's not collaborative. It's probably not going to go well. So I think everyone that's involved in this process or expected to be involved in this process should be thinking critically about it and thinking strategically and um, kind of providing assistance. So as I said before, I feel responsible for making sure I'm not wasting their time and for making sure that they have enough information to be able to achieve success. Um, and then I think, you know, they reciprocate with their uh, responsibility to deliver what they said and be able to deliver what they said in the amount of time so that I don't look bad in front of the client. Um, so we really have that trust. And I'm not going to lie, we've had people in the past who work with us who just didn't really fit this model, and so they, they didn't actually care. And that, was, that, that became really obvious really quickly. Um, I think it's, it's not really just about like, you know, the greater good or wanting the company to be profitable or even like caring about your colleagues. I feel like it's a self-preservation thing to just want to be able to do your job properly. And if you, if you have someone who isn't willing to kind of buy into that, I don't know, maybe you should find someone else. <laughs> so um, looking back at the read speaker example from the beginning, there are a few things we could have done that would have made it less awful. Um, these are just two kind of alternative approaches to, to what we did. The first one being that we could have explained, uh, we're estimating five hours. What we're going to do is add the module, and then we're going to go from there. So cheap, easy, five hours is nothing. It's, it's not a drama. Um, I have no doubt that they would have been okay with paying for additional work as long as that expectation had been set up front. So it wasn't in this case. So they had no indication that it wasn't going to be done after five hours. But if you go to them and say, this five hours is initial setup. Um, we've never used this module before. It's a new technology to us. Um, this will get us started, and then we can go from there. Um, that's a better way of doing it. And then the second approach, obviously, would have been um, just spending a little bit more time up front to find out exactly what they wanted us to build. Um, this can be time consuming, and oftentimes this time isn't paid for. But um, we ended up spending a lot more time that wasn't paid for than we would have if we had just spent a couple of hours talking to them about it. Um, and I mean, this also goes back to the client profiling idea, where um, after you've worked with a client for a little while, you can generally sense what kind of client they are and which of these approaches they prefer, or um, you can just ask them, or also you know kind of come up with something else where um, you're kind of being flexible and and doing whatever you can to make sure that they're that they feel comfortable. So um, just another example of 
a request that we took that had a little bit of a better outcome. Um, this is an actual request. So I know that this is a bit of an eye roll moment where you're like, oh, I heard Drupal has a plugin for that. We hear that a lot. But actually, this is um, not a bad place to start because uh, it's really open-ended. So they didn't really know what they wanted, but they weren't locked into something either. So they didn't come at it with really specific expectations. Uh, someone in the marketing team said they wanted a blog. Someone said Drupal does blogs. Okay, let's let's see what we can do here. So again, I mean, sometimes I get frustrated by these really kind of open-ended requests, but it's actually um, a good opportunity to collaborate with them to establish what it is that they actually want. So what we did here was um, I explained that yes, Drupal does have a blog module and we could enable it, so that's what we did. We, uh, on their staging site, we just enabled the, the module and showed them the content type and showed, how, showed them how it worked. And um, this just gave them a sense of kind of what the plugin that they had heard about was and you know, that it wasn't just a case of switching something on and it was gonna do exactly what they wanted because that's not possible. So um, this just gave us kind of a starting point to have the conversation about what the requirements were going to be for the blog. So um, you know, the other benefit to that was we were starting from the what does the Drupal blog do uh, kind of uh, perspective rather than I'm gonna invent a blog that works nothing like the Drupal blog and you're gonna have to retrofit uh, Drupal to make that happen. Now, we can always do that, and so if clients do come up with crazy things that kind of go against the grain, that's fine, but obviously we estimate it and price it accordingly, and we would always encourage them to investigate the standard Drupal option, which they can probably get to do what they want for less money, which they tend to like. So um, anyway, in this case, we enabled the content type, explained how it worked, um, talked through the requirements with them, developed a long list of things that they thought they might want. We estimated the features one by one, and um, in the end, we built them a blog that did exactly what they wanted for very little money, and they decided in the end a lot of the features that they had wanted, like subs subscriptions and notifications and all this stuff, they just didn't need them in the end because they were happy with what, with what we did in a very small amount of time. So. Um, we didn't have to argue at all about what was in scope or what wasn't in scope. Um, the team weren't getting frustrated because the requirements were constantly changing. Um, we started with not really not any information at all and just kind of built up the information and then built up the estimates as we went. Um, and then sometimes this uh, happens where you just got to say no. Um, this is a client request that I got from a client who we'd never worked with before. They came to us unhappy with a site that was built by someone else, so it wasn't quite a rescue project, but it was sort of close. And so they said, we want a landing page that can do a lot of things and it's gotta be totally flexible and um, showcase all these different content. And I was like, okay, well, what's the content? Well, we don't know what the content is yet. Just estimate it. Um, this was like a definite no-go for me because uh, as opposed to the previous example where um, they didn't have a lot of information, but I didn't think they had really specific expectations. In this case, they did have really specific expectations, but without any information on how we could actually achieve what they were sort of envisioning in their heads. So um, I just didn't think we could do it. And you know, going back to the guidelines at the start, I was absolutely not at all clear on what they wanted, and I was not confident at all that we could deliver to their expectations. So what happened next was, um, we emailed back and forth a lot, and I very painstakingly tried to extract the information that I needed in order to estimate it, but they just continued to say, we don't know yet, we don't know yet. Um, and then I said, well, okay, well, we can't estimate this feature for you. Um, we've never worked with you before. I don't really understand what you're trying to get here, so I, I just don't feel, feel comfortable um, going any further with this. And she was really unhappy. Um, she kind of, said back that I was being really difficult and why couldn't I just do what they were saying? And um, she said, you know, well, we're a flexible organization and so you need to be flexible. And I was like, oh, wait, no, no, no. Like, well, trust me, trust me, we're flexible. Um, you know, the, the idea is like, you're gonna have to figure out at some point what you want on the page. And so once you've done that, you can come to us and we'll give you an estimate for that. Um, but this kind of like, you know, it, it's that sort of like imaginary feature where you're like, I just want a page that can do whatever I want anytime I want. Oh, okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid we can't build that. Um, you know, I think there was some pressure within our organization to just make it work, but um, I could see the, you know, 
this isn't how I thought it would work or, or the kind of um, you didn't tell me that wasn't included conversation. I could just see that from a mile away. And I mean, I think the fact that this client was a rescue project was also a major red flag for me because I could already tell that the dynamic was, you know, I was thinking, well, if these are the requests that you've given to the previous vendor, no wonder the project didn't go like you thought because this is um, totally insane. So um, that's pretty much it actually. Um, my closing advice is um, just do what you think is best. Um, no, not really. But um, you should follow your heart and I think that will um, never steer you wrong. But I mean, just to sort of sum up the points that I'd like to make is the first thing is just understand exactly what it is that you're estimating. Um, if you have an organization where you don't have a really specific structure, which um, is like ours, it shouldn't be up to one person to make sure that that's the case. You kind of have a team that's working together to make sure that nobody has missed anything and that um, everybody's clear and in a really open communication process with your with your clients as well. Um, do an honest assessment of your process. So if you're finding that people within your organization are constantly blaming your developers for um, being bad at estimating, just take a step back and, and look at um, to take a closer look at why that might be happening. Um, so then from there, make sure you're engaging your developers and um, bringing them in and making them feel comfortable and, um, and extend that collaborative attitude to the clients as well. So um, it can be painful, I know. I absolutely sometimes just hate estimating, but um, unfortunately it's just a part of the job. Um, and then again, just be, be really open. If, if you can be really open and honest, I don't really think that will ever um, backfire. I think the more open and the more honest you are, the better. Um, so I actually would love to have some <laughs> engaging conversation at this point. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments or anything they want to share. Um, just go to the mic if you could so that it's recorded. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and thanks for a great uh, presentation. And I have a question about your last pathological case. Uh, I know you got a bad feeling about this person for, for understandable reasons. Yeah. But if you hadn't got that bad feeling, and they did have an open-ended requirement, under what conditions would it have been considered acceptable to proceed with them like on an hourly basis or just deal with the things as they came up? Or well, that's actually, so that's what I kept proposing. I kept proposing that we would do like a, you know, they can buy 80 hours or 100 hours or something, and that we can prioritize the specific features and um, work that way. That's how we prefer to work. And so in this case, the problem was they weren't willing to do that because she kept saying her CTO needed, of course, a scope of work that we signed in blood and then would be held to for eternity. So that's just not, that's never gonna happen. So I think, yeah, if you can propose a flexible way of working that works for you, um, absolutely, we would have been happy with that. But I think with someone you've never worked with before, it's really hard to trust that that's not gonna um, kind of come back on you somehow. So, so maybe, maybe you've talked about that, but um, for us the biggest challenge is that people are so fully booked that even if I want them to take a look at some sophisticated request, I actually need to plan them in. Is that what you do? Yeah, I mean, because we have a small team, it's pretty flexible, but if there is something that needs like a day or a couple of days, um, we obviously try to find the person who's the least booked. But I mean, I do think it's gotta be sort of an organizational priority that, um, you know, our devs do hate estimating, and as I said, I hate it too, but I think they do understand that that's the only way we're gonna get more work coming in. So, I mean, I think that, you basically the answer is you just have to prioritize it. You know, if um, if that's, w the other thing we do is we, we make sure not to schedule our devs at 100%. So um, if we're in a sprint, say, and someone has to be pulled off onto something else, that's actually accounted for in the sprint. So it's not gonna affect our ability to deliver because we always knew that something might come up. And so if some if nothing comes up, we can deliver more than we said, which is never a problem. So it's sort of like we, we plan on 80%. Um, that way we're never disappointing the client if it happens to be 85 or 90, so. Hi there, um, thanks first of all, that was a really uh, great talk with a lot of insights. I'm curious if you ever run into problems uh, providing a good estimate when the client's really pushing a fast timeline, so like they want that blog in you know a week or three days, um, and if so, tips on dealing with that, um, how to kind of help them step back so you can get those requirements even though they want it done really fast? I think if they want it really fast, the um, approach we talked about earlier was basically like, if if you don't have time to properly scope it, then what you can say to them is, look, we don't have enough time for this, but what I can say is, I don't think it's ever gonna take um, more than 60 hours to build the world's most complicated blog, so let's budget for that. If that's too much, 
Um, you know, go, go off, see if you can get that much money. If you can't, tell us what you tell us what you do have, and we'll kind of really roughly tell you what we think we can deliver in that amount of time. But I mean, we we do honestly have the luxury of. Um, as I said, most of the clients we've worked with for a number of years, and so we have that level of trust, and we almost never get pushback on um, not being specific enough. Like, we never have to have that argument about, uh, like, contractual fine print and all that kind of stuff. So for me, the communication is just more about uh, avoiding frustration and, and making sure they're happy rather than, um, you know, getting sued, so. Okay, thanks. Yeah. for your presentation. Um, what I often do when I uh, have clients asking open-ended uh, questions is try to learn from example. Uh, if a client asks for a blog, he or she probably has seen a few blogs uh, he, uh, he or she can point at and say, okay, this is the kind of stuff that I would like. How difficult would it be to implement that? And that, in often that is uh, quite helpful. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, and you can also do it the other way around, uh, if possible, ask a client what he or she does not want. Uh, so pointing at things they really don't like is uh, uh, quite informative as well, uh, very often. Um, I have another question, uh, uh, though. When the two scenarios you mentioned uh, uh, afterwards trying to prevent the, the original disaster that, uh, that you've mentioned, um, I think the third scenario of doing a short spike uh, would probably have been sufficient. Often when I work with a new module, just looking at the configuration page of that model tells me quite a lot about what scenarios, uh, what questions I need to ask uh, uh, the client. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, to be perfectly honest, that exact scenario was uh, one of those developers we had who didn't actually care. And so most of our developers would have done just that and would have wanted to know what the module does, what the client wanted. I mean, the, the placement of the thing on the page is obviously a really important question. And I think, um, especially on a site where you're using Panelizer, anytime you have like a global change. Um, so probably what happened was everyone on our side assumed it was gonna go in the header that would have been fine. Then, of course, they didn't want it in the header. Um, so, you know, again, asking that would have been fine. But yeah, be, I, I think it's safe to say any good Drupal developer would do just that, download the module and <laughs> make sure they knew what they were, what they were doing, yeah. Um, oh, how do you, you, you said that the strategic plan is something the developer has to keep in mind. Um, how do you make that work, especially when you, uh, the developer is only coming in for one estimate and maybe you already have been in the process of the project and have some insights on that? Well, we wouldn't have a developer only come in for one estimate. We would have, so generally what that would be is like a client that's on a retainer, so we do uh, work for them ongoing for years and years. So there's really never a case, unless it's someone new to the company, that they have absolutely no context or understanding of what this client is trying to do. But I also think it's sort of um, comes down to the developer. Like if you're if you're a good developer who actually enjoys what you do, um, you want to build something that's actually useful and not just something that um, gets the PM off your back. And I mean, I think that's a really important distinction of like, okay, yeah, I know what she's talking about. This is how long it would take to build it, rather than someone that goes, oh, I I kind of I think I know what she means, but I also think there might be a better way to do this. So let me ask what this is for and, and for some background. And, and even sometimes the developers will ask me a question that I'm like, oh, that's a great question. Let's ask the client. I actually didn't think of that. So it's not necessarily that they're, they're responsible for the strategic plan, but um, they have insights that I don't have and that us as the client service team don't have. And so um, I just think it's important to make sure that those insights are perceived as valuable and perceived as welcome, and um, and they're not going to be sort of treated as a pest because they they won't stop asking questions. It's sort of like the client that um, I refuse to estimate. It's like uh, sometimes if your developers are are um, talking back, it's because you're not doing the right thing. You know, like um, I think it's it's really important that you have developers who feel like they should and can um, make those kinds of you know, make those kinds of recommendations. Does, does that answer your question? Quite, uh, yeah. Okay. It gives them a strategy to go into that. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, having, um, I think we have 10 developers at the moment. Um, it's a lot easier to have that context because you don't have, you know, you, you only have 10 developers. There aren't, there isn't like a whole group of people that never heard of this client or never heard of this project. So in a sense, that's a luxury that we have that we can, um, 
you know, all be pretty much across what everyone else is doing. So that yeah, definitely helps. Part of the impact of, um, part of my thing that the developers are too much into their work they're currently doing. So that switching the mind with other clients yeah. and the other project is needs some time or some some process or some more work. So to bet, better deal with them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Um, one of the, I mean, I don't know whether this is true for you too, but w the way we do our estimation is all through Redmine, our project tracker. So I never put them on the spot and I never just ring them up and say, how long is it going to take you to do this? I'll send them a ticket with all the information that I think they need and then they can think about it, send it back. Um, maybe they ask questions for me, I send it back to them. So it's never like a kind of on the spot, do it now kind of thing. I think oftentimes they'll probably read it, think about it overnight and then come back to me. And I mean, we had, we had, we're doing estimates this week where the developer that's here, he was like, I wrote a comment, but it's sort of my first thoughts. Um, let's have a chat about it when you have a sec and then I'll do like my final assessment. So it's really a conversation rather than um, a task that they have to do. Yes. Um, thanks so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question around process. Uh, one of the things that my team struggles with sometimes is feeding the dev machine. So do you do uh, with your retainer clients estimates a, a sprint ahead so that you're always providing work or do you do a large chunk of estimates and then that gets we actually do it in not the best way, which is um, the requests come in really piecemeal. So occasionally we'll get a whole batch of work that might be two or three months of retainer work on one thing, but it's typically like really ad hoc, you know, like I need a new view or I need a new content type. And so we just do it one off. But ideally, the same few developers are going to be doing that retainer for the whole year. And occasionally you need to pull someone else in. But um, it's actually quite nice because what that what that gives us, so in a way it's not good because it's a lot of, um, kind of context switching, but what it does give us is a whole lot of work that is ready to go. So they estimate it, the client approves it, and then it can sit there for as long as a month because, or even a quarter, some of our retainers are monthly, some are quarterly. Um, we don't commit to doing it that day. We just commit to delivering it at some point during that month. So it's actually quite nice to have a batch of stories that can be kind of done in isolation. So if another client, um, you know, the sprint that we're doing, we have to take a three-day break because they're not ready, that's great because we have all this other work over here that we actually need to get done anyway. So it's, it's actually kind of a nice way of feeding the machine um, in times when you don't have a big batch of work. But I mean, I think all of our developers would say they would much rather work in the sprint, you know, big chunk of work model, but just practically for us, that doesn't, that's just not always possible. Uh, I don't know if you have this kind of situation with your clients, but if you have uh, always a PM, making the connection between the client and the dev. And some clients try to send personal emails to the developers and try to avoid all the process <laughs> and oh, can you do this for me? My clients would never do that. They know better. <laughs> um, no, I think um, we don't try to put a, up a wall. So all the communication in Redmine, unless like we can make private tickets, but all the communication in Redmine is there for the client to see. So I think they never feel like they have to go around the process because the process works really well for them. So if they write a comment on a ticket, the developer can see that. And if the developer writes a comment on a ticket, the client can see that. And so I don't have any problem at all with the client asking the developer a question or the developer asking the client a question. Um, you know, I'm, I don't need to be the middleman in that. if if they can kind of work it out themselves. So, I mean, in fact, that's probably what we'd prefer. I don't know if anyone has, was at my colleague's session yesterday or Tuesday about um, not being a control freak. I'm, you know, I'm totally happy with things being done without me. That's actually great. It means I have more time in the day. So um, I would say if your clients are trying to get around the process, there might be something wrong with the process. Hi, thank you for your session. However, I have a question that is related to big proposals and scopes. Uh -oh. So usually when you create really big proposals for 1,000 hours, you have to put here some rough estimates and high-level details, but you, you really can clarify some really deep details only when you get to the step when you create specifications and you have a lot of discovery and communication with client. And my question is how to avoid that gap between sales team or sales 
guys who are creating those proposals and technical team who is struggling with estimates. Well, don't have your sales team do your proposals would be the first piece uh, of advice. No, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't really mean that. But I think um, the way we try to work, and the contracts don't always um, necessarily represent this, but if you're, if you're pitching to your client that it's going to be agile and you're pitching to them that um, it's not a fixed price, fixed scope quote, then it doesn't, it's not really that much of a concern because the discovery and the whole sprint, you know, backlog grooming process is about figuring out what they want and making sure that you can deliver that. So I think that, I don't think we've ever had a situation where we pitched a big project and then like it came down to it and they had this crazy thing that we had never anticipated and we didn't have time to do it. You know, it's like basically you say, oh, right, well, um, that the way you've described that directory is a lot more complicated than we thought, so we're going to have to probably deprioritize some other stuff that we estimated or um, either simplify it or drop something else. And when you have that um, kind of dynamic established, it becomes just completely not a problem. And I mean, I know that probably sounds simplistic, but um, do, you, do you work in Agile methodology or yeah. you do? Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Usually we try to recalculate in that case some user stories and make some suggestion that we can decrease estimates for that user story and put ours into another one because Yeah, I mean or they can sense. or they can try to come up with more budget. Like it's kind yeah. of um <laughs> T to be honest, like the, the the way it works is like we provide them with the in inputs to make business value calculations. So, um, you know, we're we're doing our best effort to make sure you know we're not trying to swindle anybody. We're not we're not purposely trying to underestimate things. I think if anything, I'm guilty of overestimating most of the time. Um, but I mean, I I can't think of a time where we had like I said where we had that problem where we went to them and said um, this is going to take a little bit longer. We might have to drop something else, or um, you might have to get some more budget. We I mean, we've had some clients that were difficult, but um, but I think when you frame it in that way, it becomes not really a contentious or like a problematic thing. It's just it's just a decision point, basically. You know, here's the information. It's some some things have changed. How would you like to proceed? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, if there's nothing else, I think actually um, there's an estimation boff right after this. I don't know which room it's in, but. Um, you can check the boff board right outside. So if you want to continue discussion of estimations, and I know it's thrilling, um, you can do that there. And also, please evaluate the session. Um, this is really important, which I'm sure you've heard all the other speakers say. It's important for the um, Drupal Association and for us as well to kind of get feedback. So um, please, uh, please evaluate it, and um, thank you.